Welcome to the New Earth Podcast, recorded live from our vibrant New Earth Cafe. Our surroundings are filled with authentic sounds and real actions, left unedited to preserve the genuine atmosphere we embody here at New Earth. Irvin, thank you so much. You're a legend who's setting up our studio and we're building pieces yep. at a time. Now we've got this gigantic light thing that's beautifully illuminating your wonderful face, Mark. Uh, it's brilliant to have you on. We attempted last Friday bit of a mixed communication. Yeah, sorry thankfully, about that. the camera didn't work. Uh, mm. Well, thankfully, I say, we mm. couldn't make it work mm. anyway. You've been sitting, you've been sitting over for like an hour <laughs> waiting for a podcast that was never going to happen. So, all was divine timing. Well, that's fine. It just uh, fitted in very well. So, thank you very much for ah, pleasure. making the changes. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to just ask one thing. Guys, can the music? Thank you. So you guys have a bit of background music in the, the cafe here, but we're mm. going to turn it down so we can hear everything Mark has to say. So, cool. Mark, you know I'm a fan of matcha. Yes. And I'm going to have a matcha coming over right now. Our cafe is, I think, renowned to have some most amazing matcha. And now mm. we're going to explore some of the amazing matches that you have to offer. But let's delve into, you know, why are you here? A bit mm. about your history and what's mm. led you into this beautiful green liqueur. Well, that we call the matcha. Great, excellent. Well, um, I suppose we have to go all the way back to my childhood. Um, so this is an elevator pitch. Your childhood, okay. My childhood, yes. <laughs> um, uh, our father took us to uh, to Japan. Yeah. Um, for the World Expo back in um, the early 1960s. And uh, it was one of the first of the World Expos that had been in the Far East. And, of course, Japan had just come out of World War II. Um, and um, uh, it was a, something that my father thought it was very good for us to understand, that we should understand Japanese culture. And, and he recognised um, uh, that uh, we should um, learn to live with our neighbours. And part of that was taking the children to, um, uh, to Kobe. He's a pretty evolved man, it sounds like. Well, he was a... Dad was uh, born in the early 20s. He, he fought in World War II with, with the Americans, actually, okay. um, because uh, we didn't really have a, much of a navy in New Zealand. And uh, so he was seconded to the Americans. And um, so he had, a, he had a glimpse into the horrors of all of that. Mm. And, um, uh, uh, but he was determined to see that we were, didn't have the negative stereotype view that that was around re-Japan and Japanese in the, back in those days. Uh, and visiting Japan, I fell in love with the place, really, as a young young lad. Um, then, uh, later on in life, I um, decided that I was going to go to... I went to university and I spent a very short period of time in law school. Yeah. Uh, and I mainly went because my hero within the family, he was a lawyer and all that sort of thing, and I wanted to be like um, like my cousin and, you know, and, uh, uh, you know kids, are, how, do, how do you earn good money and all these sorts of things too. And I spent about three months there and um, looked around and I thought, do I really want to be like all these people that are around me in this, in this lecture hall? Mm. And um, uh, I tussled with it. And, you know, I'd, I'd sort of signed up for the course, so to speak. <laughs> and um, I remember one morning, one night, my father came into my bedroom. He saw that I was, um, was the light was on at two o'clock in the morning. He said, what's wrong? And I said, Dad, I don't want to do this law thing. It's just... It's not me. And he said, mm. don't do it. Stop it. Wow. Just move on. What do you want to do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I know I don't want to do this. Perfectly. So what that led me into was um, food and, and uh, restaurants and cooking. How? How did well, it go from it, not knowing to food and cooking? Well, I, so I, thought, I, thought, it was easy, I thought it was the easy option. <laughs> um, how yeah, wrong you were. Oh, well, absolutely, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. No, we, um, I, uh, our parents had taken us out for dinner and on a regular basis. We'd been taken overseas on a regular basis. Very unusual for a child um, uh, who was born in the 50s. Uh, and we were exposed to what was cutting-edge cuisine in those days. And um, it just seemed to me that, yeah, I'd like to be involved in it. I... I, I started up and then got into cooking and found that I really had a flair for it and had a flair for flavours and tastes and, and I very soon worked out that there was a, a better way of doing things. And uh, 
So fast forward, um, I opened my first restaurant when I was 20 years old. At 20 years old? 20 years old, yeah. I okay. had a little bit of help from dad, yeah, um, mum and dad, um, but you know, we had to pay it back and that was all part of the, the, the business ethic. And uh, long story short, we were pretty successful in market and we, um, we sat at the very top of the market for New Zealand and even um, was given uh, accolades from, from further afield than that. So oh, we were very lucky. So. What kind of accolades? Um, well, back in those days, um, uh, Michelin uh, didn't come to uh, New Zealand or Australia, but they sent their, their second level people out. And they would, um, uh, they, they, I think they deemed that New Zealand and Australia were not um, uh, worthy enough to hold a Michelin star. Uh, but they had a, what they call a, a hat tog system. Okay. And um, we received that. Okay. Um, as Thank one of only a few. The other was with um, Time Magazine. Oh, thank you. Here's cheers. Cheers. I don't know if you asked for one or not, but no, somehow... No, but I'll, I'll get one. Thank you. Well, you're the matcha man. Thank you. So well, it's how can <laughs> I drink a matcha without drinking a matcha with you? there's almost a song to that effect, isn't there? I don't know. Oh, it matcha. will be once this matcha, podcast... Matcha, not matcha. Okay, yes. Yeah, right. When this podcast goes out, there will be a song, I'm sure. Mm, thank you. Very good. Mm. Mm. Well, I'm looking forward to your matcha that's coming into thank town. You. But we'll, we'll get we'll to that. get to mm. that. So... So when you were childhood, when your experience of your childhood when you were in Japan, what was your fondest memories? Was it around the fact that the food was so different? Is that what your affinity was with your childhood? There were two things that struck me. One was the food. And I, I was just, uh, well, we hadn't experienced anything like that. You know? Everybody thinks of Japanese food as sushi. Um, yeah. but it's so not much more, cooking at all. Yeah, no, true. Yeah. But there's far more depth to Japanese cuisine yeah. than that. So I was just blown away by it. Yeah. Um, the other thing was the people. And of course we had, you know, coming out of World War II, we, we were, you know, there were friends of my parents that wouldn't buy anything that was Japanese. Um, so this was negative stereotype. But I found a, a warm and generous and, and um, hospitable people. And um, that really moved me. So when we got past the um, when I got past the the restaurant the, the restaurant stage and decided that I didn't want to be a um, uh, didn't want to be serving 100 people a night I wanted to be able to bring a quality offering to people around the world and how do we do that and uh, long story short the company that that, that um, myself and my business partner have uh, is the end result of that we had a lot uh, we had a number of different uh, versions of it um, do, in a lot of different fields um, across different um, uh, proteins, etc. Uh, and uh, until we settle on what we're doing now with Bon Accord. Uh, I spent uh, part of that journey, I spent a, a lot of time in Japan. Travelled there nearly 300 times and, um, uh, and have lived almost, I can say, have lived in Japan for, you know, for a fair period of my life. And uh, I fell in love with the, the, the culture, the ethos. The, um, I just love the way the Japanese, it's always uh, me second and, and uh, you and the community first. Mm. Um, it's, uh, I'll give you a very good example as, as to what's different between Japan and New Zealand, Australia, and probably the United States the rest and of the world. other places. Yeah. I love rugby. You know, Kiwi, go the All Blacks. Of course. Still feel ripped off with the World Cup, but that's still, that's fine. <laughs> Those referees. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was a British referee, wasn't he? Um, I thought he was actually Welsh. Close Isn't enough. He? But still, yeah, it is, well, it is British, of course, but the Welsh may not think so. Yep. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's another matter. We won't. It's, not, it's gone by, um, and as part of the uh, part of Japan, Japan has a very very strong rugby culture. Mm. A lot of people don't realise that, but it's a game that's played by the upper echelon, the top universities, the the top um, companies all have um, rugby teams, etc. etc. So you go to these rugby matches, which I love to go to. Bring your own. You can bring your own food. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to eat the rubbish that they're serving and in the stadium. Yeah. You can bring your own wine. You can bring your own beer. Yeah. Mm. And um, uh, we'd go along. You go along to a stadium that would have, you know, forty thousand people in it. 
two rugby games played. The end of the day, the end of the game, everybody would get up and they would pick up every single scrap of, of rubbish that they've had. They take it out the gate, and as you go, there's people standing there with different bags for plastic and paper and waste, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and everybody throws it into the right right bag, and off you go. Fifteen minutes later, that stadium will be empty, and you could eat off the floor. Not one scrap of rubbish there. Mm. That's Japan. Just an example. So, yeah. um, then when the Japanese uh, put a, a great, uh, st- great stead in in everything that they do, not every, not all Japanese, but you know, it's it, but it's a part of that culture. Let's do things the best I can. I often use the joke, and not that I go, <laughs> but I often use the joke that um, uh, even McDonald's tastes the best in the world out of Japan. And that is because the man who's flipping those burgers, or the girl who's flipping those burgers or toasting that bun or whatever, wants to do the best they can possibly do. Okay, now we're touching on something um, that's rather unique and beautiful in its own way because it's the act of loving the service because everything is, as we know, energy. Mm. And when you cook angry, mm. the food comes out as poison. Yep. In New Earth Cafe, you know, we check in the team, everybody's loving what they're doing and it's a whole transformation and that energy that they permeate comes into the food and people are like, what is this energy? What it makes it so different? And we feel that, you know, when there's a loving environment, mm. no matter what, if it's McDonald's or whatever food it is, if the love has gone into it, mm. it can transform mm. the ener- energetic mo- uh, molecular structure, let's yep. say, you know, because of the intention yep. that's behind it. And I, and we have it on our waters and, you know, in our machines, and everything like affirmations, mm. because this is what they actually did in uh, Egypt. You know, yes. the pyramids and the water that come out, mm. they actually had the, like affirmations written alongside the walls so yep. the water come over. Mm. That you're drinking from this sort of charged mm. water. So they knew it back then, and I think there's a, a catch up now mm. with, uh, you know, science and things like this with regards to energy and, and that intention. But that documentary on Netflix about the, the 100 cities and one of the places in Japan of the, those who live over 100, right? Mm. One of the healthiest places. I'm, mm. I'm not surprised when they come with that culture of serving and appreciating and loving what they do. I'm not sure that every Japanese person is that way, of no. course, but there is that sort of ethos. No. But by and large, it's pretty widespread. Yeah. So pretty, Well, you would know. Yeah. I, yeah. I've Very rarely do you get somebody in Japan in the service industry or in anywhere who are rude or, or um, don't care. It's a unique culture. I always say to people, it's like another planet. <laughs> because it's a it's a small set of islands which is roughly a little bit bigger than New Zealand with a population of 124 million people on it speaking a language that nobody else in the world speaks mm. the average Japanese person had not had a conversation with a foreigner until after 1945 so it's it's completely different and from that has come a culture that is unlike anywhere else in the world and I like it I love it so going back to you know, you, you've obviously had this affinity since you were a child. Your father brought you mm. there. It was so different, so unique. Mm. And you took, it seems like you invested that uniqueness and put it into your restaurant in your 20s. Yep. What, what made it stand out that you cultivated from your Japanese experience? Mainly about bringing a team together and getting the best out of everybody um, in a way that's cooperative, not con- confrontational. So... Uh, very good example. You um, you look at some of these programs with Master Chef or or um, or a number of Eng- well-known English chefs um, who are known to be screaming and yelling in the kitchen yeah. and and swearing and doing everything else. Yeah, it's good entertainment. Well, yeah, I just makes me cringe to be honest. <laughs> of course, well, and <laughs> of course for a professional, but um, and, and they don't get the best out of people, and that's the reality of it. So. Um, uh, so we developed a culture there where we, we, we gave people opportunities. We spent time um, telling people what we expected them to get to and how can we help them to get there in terms of excellence. Example, yeah. you know, how do you, um, how do you uh, boil a perfect egg? Um, how do you um, choose an excellent avocado? And how do you make sure it stays that way? Um, how do you treat it? Yeah. Um, and how do you, uh, like anything, sorry, like anything that we're doing. I make it easier for you. Like yep. anything that we're doing, um, uh, how can you get the best out of that ingredient? 
uh, and we find that once people embrace that, um, they they want to learn. Right. You got to pay people well. You got to look after them. Yeah. Care about their their families and how they are and et cetera, et cetera. And that's always been our ethos. And that's the ethos that's gone all the way through my business life um, in, and to today, even within, within our own company at Bonacord. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's important. So I learned a number of those things from Japan. Now, hey, in Japan, there are things that go on that I don't like. Like what? Oh, um, there became a fairly aggressive business culture amongst certain industries um, and that to me was mm, not productive it was particularly prevalent in the manufacturing um, food industry in Japan okay um, uh, but that's changed and since I first went there from a business perspective in 1990 um, to today you wouldn't recognize the environment that that's there so they've embraced this okay this, this what is what I think a Japanese approach to things so what, what, um, what is that exactly? Oh, bringing people along with you. Don't scream at people. Okay. I mean, there was, you know, in Japan, there were some pretty horrendous practices that went on with, um, you know, the, the, an employee, and not in all industries, in some industries, uh, where an employees would get something wrong and they'd be slapped in the face. You know, that was common. But um, fortunately, that's all changed now. So, um, uh, yeah. Didn't fit anyway with the normal Japanese ethos, I felt. So, um Okay, yep. so when you created this place, how long was your restaurant going on for? And it uh, exactly for nearly was? fourteen years. Fourteen years. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and it was like Michelin, Michelin star equivalent. No, we didn't have Michelin equivalent. Yes. Okay, we didn't have Michelin in in New Zealand or Australia. In fact, they've only just come to Australia. Oh wow! Uh, listen, don't get me started on Michelin. <laughs> um, but um, hey, uh, so many, so many other restaurants in the world um, today that are Michelin recognised. Um, those chefs have come from New Zealand and Australia and some out of our kitchen. Uh, yeah, I'm very proud of what we achieved and what we got to. So 14 years, okay. You were in the restaurant business. Um, what happened? Why did you move on? What was it and what did you move on to? There were a range of things. Auckland was changing in those days and um, uh, long story short, the building that we were in um, got bought up by a, a company that was only interested in, um, we had a beautiful old um, Victorian house in the middle of the city. Um, their view was to, um, you know, to build a, a huge high rise around it. They weren't allowed to knock it over, um, but they did everything to make it, make it uh, not a particularly desirable place to be. And at that point, I decided I wanted to exit. So um, uh, that was it, really. So you exited. Then where did you go? Did you know exactly what it is you wanted to do? or did you? Yeah, well, no, break? I didn't, actually. I got a very good friend of mine. Um, one of my older brother's um, friends at school contacted me, um, a guy by the name of Chris Hulich. And um, he's from a you know, well-known family in New Zealand um, and uh, it's very successful. And he said, uh, Mark, he said, you know, you have all these Japanese clients. And, you know, we go to your restaurant, go to number five all the time. We go to these restaurant, your restaurant all the time and we see all these Japanese, you know. Everybody, anybody who's anybody in, um, in Japanese business is coming to you. We, we want to create some business in Japan. Would you, would you work with us? And I thought, oh, yeah, okay, maybe. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> but um, I have a deep respect for Chris and we are still very close friends and um, it's a great guy. Uh, so um, I went off to Japan and um, I helped them establish uh, a very successful business um, providing a range of products to the Japanese market, um, doing things that, making products that nobody else in the world had made before outside of Japan, making that in New Zealand and bringing it um, to the Japanese market. What kind of products are you talking about? Uh, well, the biggest product was a product called Hamburg Steak. Hamburg Steak. Hamburg Steak, Hamburg steak. yep. Now... In Japan, after the war, they were dreadfully, you know, there was, the, most people were terribly poor and they couldn't afford to eat meat. And um, uh, whale meat was the main um, protein. That's why today, even in Japan, there's this affinity with eating whale meat. It's not because most people want it. Um, it's more about, oh. Necessity. Yeah, it came down to, now it's part of our culture, but when you dig deep into it, um, it, it's, it was, but it's sort of on the way out. Uh, so, uh, the Japanese developed a 
for want of a better term, uh, in New Zealand, we call it like a rissole um, or, a, a, or a sort of a form meatloaf or something along that line. And the Hamburg steak was a product, a meat or meat-based product that was consumed by the average Japanese two to three times a week in one format or another. It might be a might be a, 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 a part of a dinner, a, a, the main part of the dinner, or it could be a, a tiny little 30 gram or in a bento box, uh, through a whole range of things. More beef was consumed in Japan you, in the form of Hamburg than what New Zealand and Australia grow in in uh, in its entirety. So it was a, it, it, but it was had turned into a product that the average Japanese producer said. It marks on. It's impossible to make this product outside of Japan. You cannot do it. It's not possible. And of course, me being, you know, who I am, I said, I thought to myself, oh, well, actually, it can. Um, but but we just need to know how to do it properly. So, long story short, six hundred and something samples later, um, and spending a lot of time on development, we got our first customer, and and it grew into a, a, a significant business. And the business that I worked with with Chris and Paul, uh, Chris and Paul, but particularly Chris, um, uh, was on the basis of what we did in Japan. Was bought by the um, the French food group Danone, and um, okay. for a huge sum of money. Regrettably, I didn't get any of it. Well, how come? Oh, well, because I was working for them. Oh, but they didn't see it as, hey, you know what? You're part of this. You you helped here. Uh, yeah, that's another story. We will get down that track. Okay, well, I mean, it's a beautiful time to share a story. Yeah. <laughs> and this is like the stuff that, you know, is like uh, the substance. It's the whale meat. Well, that's true, that's true. But um, at the end of the day, um, it was a valuable experience for me. Of course. It put me on the right track. It, 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 when, when, Dan when Danone purchased, uh, purchased uh, Best Corporation, um, and I decided I was exiting at that point. Um, and I was only there for four or five years, not a long time. And it was the first time I worked for somebody. And, I, and because I, I was working for Chris, I felt as I wasn't working for anybody. I was, okay. I'm the sort of guy who says, we need to do this, this, and this, and this. And I don't need to go through some level of management who have no idea what to do to get approval. I, I just don't do that. So you had this opportunity. Yep. Um, you were met with no's. But being the type of guy you are, no just means, well, that's your reality of no. But mm. I know that no can also mean a yes. Mm. Because like anything, every problem has a solution. Mm. And you just made it happen. Yep. So you're the solution guy. However, you didn't put it down in contract terms. You just, no. you just loved doing what you were doing. I you did. were given that space mm. and, and time. And ultimately, you got what you wanted. Well, the best thing, they, I, best thing I got was the respect of the people in Japan. Which is ultimately worth more than... More than anything that could be, yeah. So that was... And, you know, when I exited, um, when, when Danone took over and I exited, um, so many of my Japanese friends and business colleagues said, Mark San, you know, we buy from Best, not because of Best, we buy from Best because of you. And um, you want to do anything? You come and see us. I and guess it's quite an accolade in oh, itself so because Japan... Away have that, you know, uh, reputation for quality. Yes, they And do. I think Sony, which we're recording from the camera now, yes. didn't just go for being the best um, cameras. I think they wanted to be seen, if I'm right, um, for those who had the, the best quality. Mm. They wanted to make Japan known for quality. Well, I think that's what it was. And they went for that goal and, and, you know, they achieved it. So there you are in this Japanese culture where there's that significance of giving everything in that moment like the, the, the samurai the, the, the respect and then to have a culture of, of respected people to mm. say it's because of you mm. what what did that give you what was the feeling and was it something you'd been seeking your since childhood well i, I feel as i should be lying on a couch <laughs> <laughs> if you want <laughs> um, uh. No, um, I suppose a little, you, you, just, you just putting it this way has made me think about it. Um, well, it's frightening. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it just gave me a deep sense of achievement and satisfaction, but more than anything, I felt just a sense of love. No. It was, my God, you know, you, these people... Because Japanese just don't say things. They don't s say things 
just for the sake of it. Um, they'll say the polite thing, oh, Mark, son, you look beautiful, you look like a Burt Reynolds or something. You, know? <laughs> you think, okay, fine. They'll say I'll things like I'll take that to the bank. <laughs> yes. but, um, uh, but in terms of something meaningful, they, they, they're very, very circumspect and very quiet. So I was very touched by all of that. And um, I just feel I'm just so lucky, just so lucky to have. The reality is I have more friends in Japan than I have of my own culture. So that's the reality. Wow. So, um, well, I'm not surprised by that mm. because it seems like the it's like your soul has this affinity. I'm mm. using that word a th third time now. Mm. Um, that you resonate with the Japanese. Mm. There's something that you recognise in them that you see in mm. yourself. Mm. What would you say that quality is? If that 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 main quality is probably the search for perfection. And you see this in some of the ancient arts in Japan. Why? Uh, a calligraphy artist, why he is so respected over somebody else. And a Western eye would look at the two and think, is there a difference? Um, down to um, respect for the, for the grower of the rice you know, and what they do um, and, and, and the various quality levels that they work with. Uh, respect for um, the, some pottery and, how's that, and how that is made. Um, or China or glassware or anything. And um, uh, they also have a history of taking an idea or a, or a product from overseas and just making it better. Now, I'm not talking about ripping things off, although there was a fair amount of that in the 50s and the 60s. A couple of examples. Um, in the, before the American gunboat um, diplomacy in the mid 1800s, uh, Japan was basically closed, and uh, the only point, points of entry were nominated countries that were allowed to trade with Japan, and uh, in the early, in the very early days, that was Portugal, predominantly, um, and and Spain, but predominantly Portugal. The Portuguese brought to Japan two things that they, I think, now lead the world in. Uh, one is beer. So um, now, I'm not a beer drinker. In fact, I really don't like beer, generally speaking. But I'll drink the beer in Japan because I think it is absolutely beautiful. High quality Japanese beer is some of the best in the world. Now I've got friends of mine in New Zealand who are who are um, uh, artisan or, um, uh, beer makers and they would dispute that with me. But from my perspective, um, I think the Japanese have taken this relatively rough ingredient, rough product from the mid 1600s and turned it into a beautiful product. The other is their version of pasta, which is all the noodles, um, uh, soba. Um, oh, I do love that. that. And the kids love their ramen noodles. Yeah, um, ramen, soba. 100%. And, uh, yep. and, and, um, yep. and they, they have turned, they took that, or well not technology, but that product, uh, a pasta product, um, and, um, and turned it into something unique for themselves. Now, everybody thinks that the Japanese have had this forever. No, they haven't. They basically started in the mid 1600s. You mentioned something before. I remember you. Um, you said there's something about the culture. There was something about this way food manufactured, and, and it, what was it we discussed before? Uh, mass production. Yeah. Certain way of mass production, and, and something that just, you know, this is something you wanted to bring attention to yes. because we we're talking about the idea of gluten. Yeah. And, and things like this because now we see now. Gluten, because you're talking about noodles and things like this, how certain gluten and how it's manufactured is actually now um, they're linking it. Doctors are seeing how it's linked to ADHD, yep. how it's linked to, you know, array of mental disorders mm -hmm. and health issues uh, because of what gluten can, can do to the body. And you've seen it in mass production from your experience. Let people know, I mean, there was a time when gluten was, you know, when it's fresh mm -hmm. and it was natural. Now mm -hmm. this idea that, you know, is causing all these know issues around the world um, what did you see and you know what do you think can be done about this well yes um, I suppose I wasn't I didn't pay much attention to to gluten intolerance etc you know until the early 1990s and people started to talk about it and I and I was a little dismissive at first you know when I was in Japan, you know, I, I, we, we, all of our products that we make with Vonicord are all gluten-free. We say it's all gluten-free, and it is. 
Um, and I'd say this to the Japanese, and oh, yes, it's, it's this and this, and it's gluten free, and they'd, you'd see the glaze eyes going, gluten free marks on? What's that? Oh, well. But in, in Japan, in Japan, they say, oh, Mark's on gluten intolerance in Japan, nobody knows about it. And I'm not saying there aren't people who are gluten intolerant in Japan, but by and large, it wasn't, I'm talking 1990s here, nobody had it. And I did a bit of further research into that and coming from the work with the Hulich, uh, the Hulich boys, um, understanding about what was happening with the manufacturing in the 1980s, what changed the manufacturing in the 1980s. We can take one sector, and I'm not saying these sectors, the sector is entirely responsible for, for gluten intolerance, but I think they go a long way, um, and that's the manufacturing of bread. Now, I can only speak for New Zealand, um, but in New Zealand we had hundreds of bakers in New Zealand, probably thousands, uh, who would be baking bread, um, proving it properly, um, and making bread as it should be made. And by the time we got to the mid-1980s, almost all of those bakers had disappeared. They'd been bought up, and we ended up with two bakeries, massive bakeries supplying the whole country. Of course, they built these massive factories, and um, the reality is they couldn't afford to, um, well, in their view, they couldn't afford to uh, uh, take the time that it, took to, 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 to prove bread properly and, and, and make it properly. So they had the high speed making systems um, and they would speed up the proving of the bread from hours to minutes. And uh, so sure, the bread rose um, and sure it sort of was fluffy and it was whatever, but it, what remained in there was massive amounts of gluten. So. A slice of bread, um, in, in certainly in the mid 80s and really in the 90s, and even today, some a lot of these mass manufacturers, uh, the amount of gluten in there is 10, depending on the bread, can be 10 times as much as what you get in a properly proven loaf. Now, for 10 or 15 or 20 years, nobody really noticed it. But at some point, some people can process a lot of gluten and it's not an issue but there's a portion of the population, and that's growing dramatically, who can't. So the body rejects it, and then you get, you know, what I don't know whether you know what happens when you become gluten intolerant, but basically you lose your ability to absorb nutrients. Um, nutrients, your intestines, nutrients yes, right? yes yeah. in your intestines. So it leaves little holes, and then it starts to seep out. Well, it get, right, basically you've got all these little millions of little... I don't know what you call them. Um, and they um, they absorb things. Well, basically you end up with a... With a with a with a with a with an intestine that's basically shiny, so it just it then just wipes everything out. All yep. the flora, all the um, natural. Yep, all the natural yeah. bugs and everything else. Yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. A, a good healthy gut would have, mm. um, and all that goes. And of course, the body then views gluten as an enemy, and so it overreacts uh, at that point. Like a histamine. Yep, like that, or like a. It, gluten itself is not necessarily, well, gluten itself, from what I understand, is not necessarily bad for you. Um, it's just in excess, the body takes it as something that's a foreign matter and then attacks it. And by that, it destroys a lot of these little... little yeah, the friendly, friendly bacteria. Yeah, exactly, in within, within the body. And so yeah. then you see this huge growth in... Um, in um, uh, in gluten intolerance, but you go to countries such as um, even today, you go to countries such as um, in Italy or in Spain, where still there is this massive culture of, of 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 baking, individual independent bakers baking away, baking the daily bread, and everybody goes and gets it. Gluten intolerance in these countries is infinitesimal mm -hmm. compared to the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, countries like in the UK who followed that. And I'm not, wh I'm not whipping the Americans, but it was basically an American system. You know, how do we do things faster? Capitalism. Yeah. Mass producing. Yeah. You know what? That was what the system was once built on. You know, mm. profit over people. How do we expand? And, you know, it's not all negative. Mm. At the end no. of the day, there was positives to it because yeah. people could get food that they couldn't get mm. before. And many positives. And most, mm. you know, some people would go into this and say, you know, that establishment they grew this, and it's all negative, mm. negative. Mm. No. 
But you know, everybody's learning and through this we, we expand with our consciousness and mm. we understand that mass production of things has its positives and mm. the downfall is 10, 15 years later, which we couldn't have known, is that there is certain intolerances that are now showing up where you know parents who are eating it now, their children, and certain, if you're looking at epigenetics and certain uh, genomes have been passed on from them to their children, that this sort of rise in ADHD has gone up exponentially. Mm. And you know we're looking at just different elements that weren't there before. Mm. And there's a lot of this truth of, you know, there were certain foods eaten, and not to go into the conspiracy theory that they were doing it to, you know, mm. control no. or dumb down I people. I don't believe it. It's just a matter of taking an opportunity and running mm. with it. And there was certain protocols around, you know, should they have slowed it down, should they not? But people are people, and they do what they need to do. And, uh, you know, it's just awareness at the end of the day, and, you know, bringing people like you on to have this knowledge to, you know, share it to the world, it, you know, it comes down to a matter of choice. And when a community comes together and shares knowledge, mm. like we're doing, uh, we could then are well informed and we go, okay, well, when I go to that supermarket, do I buy Warburton's or whatever it might be, or Hovis, or do I choose to buy from a local you know, bakery or bread that is a little bit different than my normal white bleach bread? Well, it's there. Doesn't mean it's evil, because mm. you know, it's just there. I do have a choice and I can go over here and pick up this type of bread. And the mm. things that we like here are the sourdough that we make without gluten. Wonderful. With the turmeric in there, so anti-inflammatory mm. as well. And it's just like combining these different mm. things and going, well, here it is. You can have a tasty, nutritious breakfast mm. without feeling like you have to have the white bread. And I have to say I was guilty growing up with it. You know, uh, English breakfast, good old thick white uh, mm. bread. And it was delicious, you know. Mm. Of course it was, but I didn't know, mm. you know, I didn't have these things, I didn't have no. this awareness. But I did have my difficulties, mm. you know. I, I could say it's ADHD, um, lack of focus and everything else. And I wouldn't say everything is linked to gluten and food, no. but it's certainly a big slice of, you know, that condition could be linked to this. And I think, you know what, I think everybody who is watching this wants to be the best version mm. of themselves. And if they can just make a slight little shift and move on to something that's going to serve their body and it's, it's, it's medicine rather than something that's going to deplete them and take their energy away. Well, you know, why, why wouldn't you make that choice? Mm. Because at the end of the day, you want to be your best version to whatever it is you love to do in life, mm. whatever that is. You may as well have the energy mm. and not 10 years later find that you have certain, you know, ailment that needs curing. Mm. And, you know, prevention is better than the cure, right? Yep, yep. exactly. Exactly. I agree with you. And it's... Um, and I, I do think that, you know, in the environment that we're in, be it um, the air that's around us, the water that we drink or the food that we eat, really does contribute greatly to the health of us as an individual. It's naive to think otherwise. Um, so if you're going to eat masses amounts of processed white bread or, or your masses amounts of um, uh, uh, filler sausage or, or whatever, all of these things that are just being shortcutted. Um, and uh, you're going to, it's got to have an effect on you one way or another. One of, one of the biggest things I think that's, particularly in the United States, um, that's been a contributor to, um, to the massive problem of, um, of obesity there uh, has been, was the introduction of um, corn syrup. Now, you can almost track it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, they've had, they've had um, Senate committees and all these sorts of things on why, how do we tackle the obese problem, but... Like most things in life, uh, the, the solution is not rocket science. You just look and see and, and, and you can draw some pretty decent conclusions. It's what the, because you're, you're, you're English, of course, and yep. in fact, so it's what the English and people within the empire um, uh, used to call common sense. And, uh, and if with, with corn syrup, I mean, it's just disaster, absolute disaster. Mm. And... Yeah, they took a product that, that was actually <laughs> invented by a Japanese fellow. Um, it will f and um, uh, uh, they put it into everything. Everything. So people talk about the evils of sugar, and I know you particularly are, 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 are very concerned about it. But sugar is a natural ingredient used in a sensible manner, um, grown properly. Um, uh, uh, is it, it, sure you've got to you've got to limit your intake, but the devil was in 
mimicking sugar. And that's where more, more sugar use, certainly up until in the very recently, used to be in fructose. Sorry, mm. sorry, used to be in corn syrup. Mm. And, and, and that is where the devil lay. Uh, so with corn syrup, you, you eat sugar, the body's got two things it can do with it. And you know more about sugar than I do. But, but I'm not sure if I do. But, but, yeah. but it, 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 it can do two things with it. It can, it can about roughly 50% to 60% of the sugar, it can, the body will grab always the first thing it can to get energy, the easiest to process. Um, and you think of glucose. Um, the body will take that and bang. Oh, wow, here's a, here's a cheap, um, fast uh, recharge. We'll use that. Bang, it's used and it's gone. But then you have a small balance that the body can only do one thing with, and that's add it to fat. With, with corn syrup, the body can't process it. It all goes to fat. So if your entire diet is based around the bread that you have or the ice cream that you get or the... The, 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 the whatever treat that you want to buy, anything that's sweet, things that you may not realise have got, sh got, and sugar's got the un sugar's got the unfair um, rap about this because it's been corn syrup um, put into it, like your baked beans or your things that you wouldn't dream would have a sugar component. Corn syrup was going into that, and of course the Americans, everything got cheaper and cheaper. Then you you consume this product. Um, it doesn't make you doesn't make you um, feel full. It doesn't satisfy you in reality, and people are just consuming more and more and more of it. And okay, it's a simplistic view, but wow, America use America use United States and Canada use corn syrup more than any other country in the world, and still do. And just look, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's evident. Um, I mean the. The culture there is very much uh, consume as much as you can uh, because at the end of the day, where's the nutritional value coming from? The, the body is looking for nutrition. You can eat less and just have a high nutrition and suddenly you're, f you're full. But uh, not only that, it's you know the emotional damage as well because people mm -hmm. are not feeling, you know, this is the idea of the American dream and then you, you can see in California, for example, that a lot of people are living the American nightmare. You know, because you're, you've got to balance things out, the universal, you know, laws of duality. Mm. So there is that desperate need of uh, nurture and care and, and mm. love in places where, you know, they're, they're still riding the waves of capitalism and profit mm. over people. Mm. And, you know, n there's no judgment. It's just, you know, some are acting from that place because they've been conditioned to believe, well, that's just how it is. Mm. That is the American dream. Mm. But you know, what cost is that pursuing the American dream to everybody else around you? And I think this is when you know, we're in Dubai right now and you know, it's, it's interesting, it's like Dubai is like when New York first kicked off, there's this sort of feel of international people from all around the world, mm -hmm. 146 different countries. I was, we had a podcast with these uh, our lovely ladies from Shura who help people and set up businesses mm -hmm. here and you know, we can see there's this sort of camaraderie of people coming together here because it's sort of new, new mm. territory. And rather than sort of ste stepping into the, 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 the mindset of, like, okay, it's all about setting up companies and mm. it's about profit, profit, profit. You know, it's a paradigm shift where we're looking at, okay, if it's not about money, but of course we need to, you know, expand and, and grow. And with that, you need to pay people, you know, but it's not about just making money, it's actually utilizing what we have, for example, a cafe and bringing mm. you on, where we're doing a podcast like mm. this, and putting it out there and giving value. Mm. And by product, maybe that people do come and hear about the cafe, or they hear about our self-love store mm. next door, and they want to pick out purposeful mm. products, mm. that we can shift the paradigm and not tread over people because mm. of our vision and dreams that we have. Mm. That in fact, it's, well, how do we, expand and grow but include everybody on the journey mm -hmm. you know rather than making it profit over people how do we make it that it's about people over profit and in fact the profit comes from the fact we're taking care of the people because mm -hmm. the people are taking care of us and now we're a community and it feels like we're transcending the globalization mm -hmm. method where the big bread companies come in and buy up all the the bakers now there's a sort of movement and i and I it's coming from somewhere that this 
we're now looking to like for New Earth being an example. Okay, how do we bring people like you, mm. where you are like the baker, mm. and rather us getting big enough to buy you out, mm. how do we give you the platform to speak mm. about what it is you do that's unique, mm. and we partner in the way of that you supply to us, mm. and because of that we give you the platform so more people can hear about you, so that you actually grow, mm. and every person who wants to jump on here who is a, you know, a baker, mm. a small one-man band can come on here and have mm. a voice. Mm. Because before, no one had that voice, didn't mm. have the opportunity. And they just thought, you know, I'll take the, the easy way out, the money mm. now, because, mm. you know, they make it such an attractive offer. And in fact, I'm sure those bakers didn't really have full knowledge about what they were truly doing. And they probably didn't have the foresight to know what they were actually giving up, you know? And I think people are starting to realize, you know what? Yes, life is easier when one company does everything mm. for you, but when they have a monopoly, and they know that oh, nobody's watching and they're tied you know, with certain MPs or government officials that they can find a cheaper way. Mm. And it's, they're the ones who are monopoly. They can use corn syrup. They can use a lot more gluten. Mm. It's cheaper. Mm. You know, it's okay mm. because that's the model. It's mm. profit. Mm. But then as we see, short-term gain, fantastic. Long-term, destructive. Mm. And now we're seeing it the other way around where we go, well, what's the long-term here? Mm. If we're building the new earth, that means inviting people in. That means speaking about it. That means nurturing mm -hmm. one another. That means giving everybody the platform that we can all expand and grow together, mm -hmm. that we don't need this monopoly. But mm -hmm. in fact, let's recognize one another's mm -hmm. strengths mm -hmm. and give everybody the opportunity to uh, have that voice and not be bought out again mm -hmm. and not go down that slippery road because we've seen the downfalls of that. Mm -hmm. And there's been the upside, but we can learn from the upside as well. But we do not want to just, I'm sure people don't want to just end up with a couple of companies mm. around the world that just govern everything. No. I think it's time for the rise of communities mm. to come together again, mm. that with together the people and the voice that we have, we're actually far more powerful mm. than the few major companies out there who put their special adverts on with their, you know, glossy look over where they pretend to care because really behind the scenes it's, profit, 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 and they do the smart marketing campaigns, but now it's people talking and mm. sharing that we can actually go, well, let the people make a decision. Let mm. them be able to discern between those who have mm. the glossy cover, mm. and really they're putting corn syrup behind the things, or those that are being transparent, sitting here and talking mm. from their hearts, because Mark, you've been sharing what it is that you've loved since mm. you were in your childhood, mm. and why you're stepping into it, and we're gonna talk about Matcha after this, and how you met uh, Matt as well. Uh, at Raw, and you know, coming together, that this is this is the movement now. Mm. You know that we can actually start to give back to the people the very things that we love, and watch people thrive and, mm. and get better, and actually heal these mo these these conditions that had been given onto them because profit over people. Mm. What can we do now when it's not about profit over people, but it's people over profit? How can the world look then? You know, what does that look like when we don't make, we're not governed by money. Money is not God, you know, that in fact, we're looking to separate that and use, use money as an energy form with one another that can contribute to the communities from making local communities to global communities and really connecting the world that you have your voice that can be heard in Japan, it can be heard in Australia, it can be heard in mm. the UK, you know, so... I kind of went on a bit of a tangent there. No, 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 no. Um, it's interesting because it's, uh, you've mentioned this um, profit over people thing a number of times, and, the, uh, and, and I agree with you, but there were some fundamental changes that happened in corporate governance and corporate um, morality uh, that came about in the, from the mid-60s onwards. And it was the responsibility of the corporates shifted from responsibility to the community and their shareholders as a whole, to shareholder benefit will always come first. Now, our grandfathers who were in corporate environments or whatever, they would never have agreed to that. But it was a theory, and I forget the name of the American um, uh, economist who, who started this, it's very well known, but sorry, I just can't remember his name now. He was the one who started this premise. It's shareholder first. Well, I'm sorry, that is what caused 
all the problems we have within corporate culture today. It is not for the benefit of the shareholders. A, a company cannot exist in any environment unless they have everything else that's around it to enable them to be making product. They have mm -hmm. the roads, they have the, the educated people, they have the, um, the, the safe environment, they haven't got somebody hurtling bombs at them or whatever it is every second minute. There is an army in place, there's a police force, there's a, there's a health system in place. You cannot divorce yourself from that. You have to have a responsibility for they're it. Uh, avoiding, they're, they're avoiding themselves from the responsibility yep. that their companies are having also a negative effect. When they yep. go, okay, uh, turn a blind eye, it doesn't matter, make money, like the Boeing story. You know, yep. they came in, suddenly it was profits over safety. Yep. And then planes were falling out of the sky and they're like, oh, it's because of the pilots. And then, mm. you know, they point the finger everywhere else. And then at the end of the day, you don't exist. Exactly. When you, I mean, you may get your gains then. Mm. And we're seeing companies, you know, mm. hanging out and doing the best they can because they're, you know, hanging on what they can and, and, and sort of leading out mm. uh, people so they can stay in, in this profit, this money. I mean, mm. how much do they really need? When it comes to the point of how about appreciating the people that has had given you the success that you have, mm. you know, where's the appreciation? If you're not appreciate, whatever you appreciate, appreciates. And what you don't appreciate and you're not grateful for is taken away mm. from you. Mm. And y we see it's a universal law literally in play here, mm. you know. Yep. So it's interesting you mentioned this guy and we'll bring it up on the video. The person mm. you may have forgotten. Let me know later. We'll Absolutely. put it up on the video. Mm. I will. So going back to how you've came to Dubai because mm. um, Matt told a story that you were sort of sitting in his real coffee and then boom you guys sort of met up during COVID and then they say the rest is history. Yeah so it's um, that was the elevator pitch I think but um, uh, <laughs> the reality was that um, <laughs> yeah, our biggest market for our business is Japan you know it's it's uh, in terms of export market outside of the southern hemisphere. Um, and uh, I was in Japan. I, oh, if I, I'll let go back a couple of steps. Uh, Bonacord had dabbled here in, the, in Dubai. My business partner, Paul, would say, oh, Mark, we should be in Dubai. And everybody's telling us we should be in Dubai. And I had a very negative view of it. I didn't want to know about Dubai, to be honest. I kept thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what did you think of it? I thought it, I just thought it would be the sort of place I wouldn't really like. And so I never wanted to come. Anyway, my partner said to me, Mark, we've got some partners in the UAE. Let's you and I go. He, 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 sorry, he went, he went to Dubai because I'm responsible for export around the world, but, but I wouldn't go. And he went to Dubai and he picked up some partners here and, and, um, and we had some consultants that we paid a lot of money to who, who found us these people and blah, blah, blah. And then basically we sold nothing. Sign an agreement away for you know th uh, two years or three years or something. Yeah. Anyway, that agreement was coming up for re for renewal, either cut it or do something else. And um, Paul said to me, "Mark, I want you to come to Dubai with. Oh, I don't want to come. Come on, we're coming. We're going. Let's fly to Dubai, spend a couple of days, see what you think, and then um, and then you go on to Japan. This is January, 2020. I flew into Dubai, and I've despite. Every effort I made to not like the place, I thought, actually, you know, it's really not too bad. <laughs> yeah. And then I got to the point, gee, this is really interesting. Wow, they've done this in this period of time. My respect for the government and the people and what they've achieved in here was the monarchy, went, yeah. I just couldn't believe it. I thought, mm. wow, this is incredible. Um, so I was taken, uh, taken aback by all of that and just very, very impressed. So my mind had changed that quickly. Um, Paul said, I said to Paul, no, listen, I'll take this over. I'll okay. come over here and uh, I'll fly. I can, it's either it's 10 and a half hours to New Zealand or it's 11 hours from Japan or 11 hours to Dubai and it doesn't matter to me. So um, I said, well, I'll do it. Okay. Talked with some interesting people and then was said, listen, come back after Ramadan because once Ramadan hits, and we're, we're into mid-February by that point, once, we're late February, once Ramadan hits, then... Um, yeah, nothing happened. So I was like, oh, I'll come back. I think it would have been May was the idea to come back. Um, I flew to Japan, was there for about a week. The next thing, COVID hit. My Japanese team said to me, oh, Mark-san, you know, we'd like you to stay with us here in Japan. We, we're, we're critical in a critical phase here. And would you please stay? We'll look after you. We'll make sure you, you, you don't, you know, 
get sick. I don't know how they're going to do it, but yeah. And so I stayed for that six months rather than going home to New Zealand. After six months, the Japanese government, because all the governments in the world were doing some pretty crazy things in those COVID times, said, listen, I'm sorry, Mark, but your visa's up. Um, uh, we extended it once. Um, uh, COVID times, you've got to go home. So I rang Paul and he said, go to Dubai. Listen, too much good happening in Japan. Go to Dubai, close it all down, and, and then come home. What were you closing? Sorry, what, what were you doing at this time? We were we su we were supplying a um, all of our Bonacord products into a into an importer here, and um, uh, it, listen, they they just weren't didn't have the capability to to do what you need to do to sell our products. They couldn't see the difference of our products to everybody else else's products. That was that was the issue, and um, so what we needed in this market was somebody who really understood that. So it was, it was decided that, hey, listen, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Right. We need to end the relationship that we have up there in Dubai. Mark, go home, close it down, and then get in the plane and come home. Well, I got here, and I kept looking around saying, our products should work in this market. You know, we just got the wrong partner. You know? And, and um, long story short, I went, I discovered Raw, and I thought, wow, this is interesting. Then I found out they were Kiwis who owned it. I thought, wow. They should know. And uh, and then I tried to see them. Well, it was like getting an appointment with the Pope. Um, I couldn't get it. And um, uh, so after three or four attempts to get to see Matt and Kim, um, I, um, I went to uh, say goodbye to a chef friend of mine who's, who was, um, was cooking. It was chef at the Western at the time. And Jay, and he, and I, he said, oh, how do you, do you find your, you know, do you find us a year? But they won't see me. And he said, really? Who is it? And I told him. He said, oh, okay, well, it's a shame. Well, okay, have a good trip home. I'm in the taxi back to the hotel. My phone gets a text. I've got you an appointment at Raw tomorrow afternoon. So he had obviously picked the phone up, <laughs> said to Matt of Kim, you know, you should talk to this guy, you know, really. So anyway, I went there the next day, and as I walked in, I saw Jay sitting with Matt and Kim, and um, uh, he sort of got up from the table and patted me on the shoulder and said, Mark, I've told him what I think. Now it's up to you. Kim's very um, personable and she has a big smile on her face and Matt sitting there, I knew he didn't want to really be there. Um, and I said, listen, Matt, I'll make you one drink. And if you like it, we'll stay and we'll talk. If you don't, I'll pack my bag, you'll never see me again. He said, okay, yeah, this is good. You know, you know Matt, <laughs> this, is, this is good. Yeah. yeah, He's probably thinking, oh, you're all right. You know? <laughs> Can't wait. And I made him the marcher. And I uh, brought it back and took one sip. And he said, oh, and give it to Kim. And, she goes, and they were looking. And he says, is, this, is all your stuff as good as this? And I said, better. We sat down, and after that, the rest is history. We formed a relationship and, a, and, a, and, and signed a contract, um, a supply contract within four to five weeks. And uh, we were all go. Um, uh, I was delighted because I could clearly see what attracted me to Raw was their philosophy, their ethos was matching ours, you know, direct supply, um, uh, beyond organic. Um, uh, quality first, always quality, quality, quality. So, so for us, it was a, a natural synergy, synergy, and that 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 really worked. So, why would you recommend matcha over coffee? Well, matcha matcha has all of the the healthy elements that coffee can supply you and does, um, and more. Uh, a lot of antioxidants, uh, anti-inflammatory. Um, it's a very, very, it's a, a super health food. Mm. Um, but um, if you start mixing it with um, sugars, um, you're going to you're going to you're going to dilute that effect. You know, it won't it won't go away, but you'll dilute that effect. Um, matcha is just a magical ingredient. It's just a magical product that has, has been grown in Japan for. Hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, in a in a in a particular way, and then processed in a particular way. So matcha is basically only it's it's the top two, and sometimes depending on the plant, three leaves of the new growth of tea, green tea. 
um, you don't grow matcha, you grow green tea and then you turn it into matcha. So the growing of the product is important, how it's grown and what environment it's grown and then how it is harvested. And, uh, and then how do you then turn it into that magical matcha powder and that is a science all into itself and very complex. All natural, time consuming, but you end up with this beautiful matcha ingredient. Like the embodiment of the Japanese culture, really. It's just exactly, exactly. It's the buyers, sorry, the, the not the buyers, the growers that we work with for our matcha, you know, we've been working with them for a long, long time. We buy directly from them. Mm. Um, uh, they also have their own manufacturing facility. They've grouped into a cooperative and they, and they, they, um, they manufacture product like, um, I, I think there's about four of them. They're all equally growing, equally good product and, and doing uh, wonderful things. But, but, um, but the key to it is that the, these, these families, 350 years ago, were all f f fleeing the, the wars that were going on in Japan at the time for power. Uh, between the um, the royalists and the and the the, the shogunate, and um, uh, they all fled high up into the mountains, um, which today is relatively easy to get to because there's tunnels, but then there weren't. So 350 years ago, they they, they, they they escaped, stayed up there, and they started growing green tea and then creating matcha. Um, our growers that we, we, we buy from, they've been growing, their families have been growing their matcha for 350 years. Mm. It's continuous, just... Generational. Generational, and they are passionate about it. Also, they're growing at high altitude, at uh, above 600 metres. And then people say, well, so what? Well, again, you use the coffee analogy. You know, coffee that's grown at a higher altitude, um, you're getting into your specialty grades, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, with matcha, it's exactly the same. So, um, and then you have the method in which the, the, the product is grown. So matcha, high qu a high quality green tea, um, during that first 60 days, when uh, the, the green, gr the, fir the fresh growth's coming through from uh, springtime. Here's an example. But all of these will be covered. Now, that's expensive and time-consuming to do. It slows the growth down, mm -hmm. but it, it increases all the, the good nutrition that you have within matcha, within the, sorry, within, the, um, within the tea leaf. Yeah. And those top two or three leaves that, that are harvested will have more of the, all the goodness that you would expect to get in a matcha than if, if it's just open to natural sunlight because it just grows and you know, very, very fast and it loses all that punch. Wow. Um, and, I mean, look at it. I mean, it just, it's beautiful. And yeah. I could take this picture. I've got pictures <laughs> on my phone that I took in the middle of winter up, you know, up six, at 600 metres. And although it's not green like this because of the middle of winter, you look and go, wow, look at the beauty of it. Mm. That is part of what Japan is. And it's very tranquil. Yep. You it know, is. and it's how amazing. it's all. But then you get through to the. Then it's you so get, perfect. Then you get through to the harvesting. Everything is hand harvested. Oh, that's cool. Right? Now, these women in this particular picture, yeah. they and their, their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and whatever have been harvesting matcha for a very short period of time. It's only harvested over a very short period of time, hand harvesting it for generations after generations, hand-picked, no machine, no machine. So the cheaper matcha that you'll find, it could be grown in some reasonable areas, it will all be machine harvested. Of More course. than likely, it will not be covered. Mm -hmm. That's... Um, uh, what is? And then that is the grinder. Voila. So you use stone grinders. Now that grinder is about as big as you can see in this picture. Okay. It will it will it will grind only about no more than 400 grams of March raw material of, of, of tea leaf to turn into March, and it will take four hours. Wow, quite a lengthy process to do that. It's expensive. Wow. It takes time, it's all stone done, but they will have thousands of these in, in, in their plant, make, grinding them that way. And not only that, I mean, look, this is, I think, why I love matches so much, unconsciously, because of the depth of 
love they put into it. And you, you said it before, I, they can be in McDonald's, but they so how they put their energy into mm. it, is it, it, it's, it makes it the best McDonald's. Uh, very far cry from uh, New Earth. But looking at that, I mean, generational and the love they put into it, this is why... You, you know, we can taste that, that we have this hand-picked matcha in our, in our matcha here, that it's just mm. so exquisite yep. that, you know, this is why we're so in love with the products that we have because it has a story and how it comes to us in this manner. And, you know, I'm looking forward to having the new matcha mm. coming in from these guys when you're ready yep. to explore. When, did we, when do you say that is around? Well, we're flying some product up, finished product up, um, so Madden can can be um, exhibiting this at Taste to Buy. Well, we say Taste to Buy here in New Earth Cafe. Oh, probably at <laughs> the same time. <laughs> when is that exactly? Uh, <laughs> well, it'll be before the twenty third of of February. Okay, so not too so far away. So, so we have a month, and then people who've just watched this go, oh, twenty third of February. Uh, let's come down. We'll put a little thing out on our Instagram and, and put it out there that the new matcha, which is mixing with the coconut, is here for anyone out there who wants to. Give it a go. Yep. I love it. It's going to be added to our menu when it's ready to be added to our menu when yep. you bring out the products. Um, that's awesome. So is there anything else you'd like to share? Just heading back to healthy eating. Yeah. Um, in Japan, you know, they have the longest life expectancy in the world. And they have that for a reason. And it's pre predominantly their diet. They are a fermentation culture. And we've moved away from fermentation foods. We used to have it. Mm. Um, Germany still does. has a very good fermentation culture in the foods, but through ways of pickling,s or um, uh, for things like natto, or a whole range of Japanese fermented foods. So Japan, J the average Japanese would consume a reasonable amount of sorry fermented-based food every day. That provides the the, the right um, uh, good bacteria. It gives the energy to the good bacteria that's there because our, our gut is a balance of good and bad bacteria. You've got to have both. But the good's always got to conquer the bad and, um, and uh, fermentation's the way to go. Uh, that's really, really important. Um, and I think I would be, I'm encouraging teams, our teams that we're working with, you know, say in Raw, I, I work with the, the, the kitchen there to help them. I don't work in it, but I work with them how can we improve things? What can we do to make things things better mm. in a cafe environment? Mm. Um, and fermentation, um, and fermentation foods that taste fabulous is, um, is uh, the other way to go. Well, we work with Raw, obviously, for our coffee, and mm. they say it's the best coffee in town, though I don't drink coffee anymore. Mm. I think it's to do with my wild uh, lifestyle I had in my mm. uh, teens and early 20s that my, um, the adrenal glands yes. overactivated. Yep. So it has a kind of this effect to me. Matcha doesn't, thankfully. And in fact, it's just healthier, as you said. It's got more health benefits. So, you know, what could be seen as a negative has nudged me in the direction I needed mm. to go because disease or illness is just a feedback mechanism to bring us back into equilibrium. It's just, um, I, I guess, if we look at illness as a bad thing, we're going to judge it rather than, oh, it's, what's it? What is the feedback? What is it telling me, mm. right? And like food, if we eat certain foods like gluten or our, you know, our stomach, our guts, which is our second brain, sometimes maybe even be our first brain, mm. um, you know, when we have the antibiotics and we're ill and we jump to these things, we're actually knocking ourselves off kilt. And they say that even the viruses and certain um, bacterias um, have their own intelligence. And so they can actually govern us mm and make us do things that we wouldn't usually do. So it's so important to have that balance within ourselves, like we mentioned, the certain foods that to eat, to give ourselves the best opportunity we possibly can to mm. be in the right mind. But it also has to be readily available. It has to be reasonably priced, the food that you consume, um, so that everybody can afford to get it. And this is, what, this is why I keep going back to Japan. And, and like on fermentation, it's not only in the food that you're eating, it's in the way in which product is produced. There's also fermentation is a very important part. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in waste in Japan, um, I have a very close friend of mine who is a leader in that, that field of treating organic waste material. Anything that's organic that you throw away. 
waste material. Yeah. And um, uh, they can take that product, adding in bacteria, just normal, regular bacteria. They put it in like a swimming lane for 25, 25 metres long and it gets turned over every day. And by the time you get to day 25, that stinking rubbish that's putting in there is, is humus, forest humus soil. That's packed full of all this healthy bacteria and all the all the, that you would need in, in terms of a fertilizer or or something, all completely natural, remediating the soils. Another example, a very fast example, is um, uh, another company that I work with. Um, uh, again, friends. They're not we're not in business together. It's just understanding what they're doing. Uh, they. Uh, run a system for the dairy industry in Japan. Now, Japan has a dairy industry bigger than, than New Zealand. New Zealand's the largest dairy exporter in the world. Um, but they, give, they provide fresh milk to 124 million people every day. You never see any pollution problems. You never see any, any issues, generally. But what they have is they have, a um, again, a bacteria. So when you go to the ma major part of um, waste within dairy is within, within the milking shed. If you think about it from a New Zealand's perspective, or or where cows have to spend a certain amount of period of time inside because of the weather, um, cold, they can take all of that waste. They can uh, they feed they feed the animal um, in its water this very good bacteria. Um, uh, that 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 will take that waste that awful waste across six ponds over over over. Um, 60 days, and that water from that waste, you could put a cup in and you could drink it. It's that pure. Mm. But the other benefit of that water is you can take that water, and it's again full of all this healthy, all these healthy uh, bacteria that you then spread on all the pastures, and that remediates the soil, helps the grass grow, all the things that you need to do. Simple, simple, simple. Bacteria. But you you, t you, go, you go and talk to people in the in the Western world. They look at you. They what? Oh, it's rubbish. It's it's you know why haven't we heard anything more about that? And I said because Japan's a country where they speak a language that nobody else in the world speaks, and they're too busy looking after themselves in this in this this format. They try to teach people, but but people, you know, particularly when you go in the West, go oh Japanese. You know, can you really trust them? All that sort of nonsense that we hear. Um, but boy, there's wow. there is so much good in Japanese agriculture around, particularly around this form fermentation um, and, a, and around waste control and turning waste into something that is actually very, very useful and a very reasonable price. You know, there is an answer there and that's what I'm very passionate about. And I, wanted, I want the world to see that as well. That's beautiful because mm. sustainability, you know, is Everything. really, for us, you know, how do you bring sustainability, not just within the idea of food, but mm. sustainability in the, now within the idea of business, mm. where we set up companies like we've set up New Earth Cafe. How mm. can we make it sustainable that it supports the community, mm. the community supports the cafe, and it supports other products, that there's this synergy going on, that there's a sustainability. And as we get to the point where we start to cultivate farms, when we're in that position, maybe we'll bring you on and, and sort of have a chat on this podcast about, okay, here's our farm. What is this way of the Jap Japanese making? How do we make that happen? Because I love that idea of utilizing this bacteria to put it back into the, mm. the farming because it's reaping so many rewards. Why would you not? Why, there's no such thing as waste. You know, no. How do we put it back in? And it just becomes this, this beautiful, self-contained sustainable because th the idea of being sustainable like when you make your life sustainable and the business mm. helps you and you help the business you live within your means not too much and you can sort of let go into that mm. because in that sustainability is a support system that you support the business the business supports you you support people and the people support you it's beautiful because you're not looking to take you're looking to give and then this receiving happens you know and it just becomes this with a synergy, mm. you know, and it, I mean, the fact that you're saying that most people don't know about this way yet is incredible, mm. you know, because of some misconceptions they have about mm. the Japanese culture mm. or what it is that, you know, why, why we haven't heard about it, then it, you know, it's obviously bad or whatever they have this mm. 
preconceived ideas about you know the Japanese. Why why do you think that is that they, you know, is is anybody adapting this this um, way of farming um, outside of Japan? Not yet. Wow. Um, but uh, in the next few years, I hope to help my friends in this area to demonstrate. It'd be great to do a a um, uh, a pilot plant somewhere for people to see how do you, how, how do you take this way particularly with waste our biggest problem one of our biggest problems is waste, sewage waste it's all full of heavy metals and it's just terrible but this bacteria this treatment bacteria it eats the heavy metals and and when you get to the far end at the other end you, you, I mean, it's not done to be nuclear waste in there. It's, it's, but just normal sewage sludge is, the, is really, really bad um, because everybody is discharging it in, into the sewage system and industrial is as well, so you're getting a lot of heavy metal waste. And in Japan, the same thing happened. Um, but those bugs will eat the heavy metal. And when you get to the end, it's all gone. Now, I'll give you an example of what things that really got me annoyed. I was working with a... Um, a, 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 a a city in New Zealand, I won't name the city. They were interested in this, this concept to treat their sewage waste because they wanted it to be sustainable. I took up some, um, some um, uh, experts in the field from New Zealand and they just, they couldn't believe their, they wouldn't, they wouldn't believe their eyes. They wouldn't believe the test results that they were seeing and doing. And in the end, I sat, had dinner with several of them and they said, you know what, I think, Mark, I think they're going in there at night and I think they're taking that heavy metal out and doing something and they're supplying us with this product at the end, which won't show any heavy metals. That's the mindset. Why would you think that? Well, the Japanese. Do they actually care enough to do this? Yeah. Well, they didn't have to. Well, they, they, they just don't understand that Why there was not on? the trust. Mm. Here it is in front of your eyes. You can see it. Mm. You can test it. You can do whatever you want. And the, and, and the thing is, it's impossible for bacteria to eat heavy metals. Well, actually, it's not. Well, and it can. They've been saying that uh, plastic will be a thing of the past. They've already found a solution of well, certain bacteria eating plastic now. That's right, and you see that examples of that in, in this particular system where, you know, when you're getting waste trucks that are putting things in, and there'll be some plastic bag, not, you know, huge amounts, but by the time you get to the other end, that plastic's gone. Mm. The, 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 and it, we're only talking, you know. Whatever the problem Should is, we'll always find a solution. Yep. And with that solution, there'll be a new problem. And yep. it's a ne never-ending. So no. if you think you're going to live life without having any problems, yeah. um, you better get on your knees and pray for yeah. one because you're probably not here anymore. Oh, of course. So, you know, the beautiful thing is that we have the capabilities to find a solution to any problem. And it's just a matter of communication mm. people don't know what they don't know and here we are having a podcast talking about mm. somewhere in japan that whoever may be listening to is going ah oh, i wouldn't mind exploring this and just mm. it would be good to, it'd be great to have the details of sure. th these guys so that we can yep. have it on the video mm. Mm. you know Absolutely. to show so they can see what these yep. people are about and so that and the farming techniques you know we'll uh, we'll find the name and so people can sort of research a little bit more if they, they're interested in it because this is what it's about um i had no idea mm. nobody knows about it because at the end of the day, I don't know how many podcasts you've done. A couple. A couple, yeah. And if you've had this conversation about it or not. Not so much. This no. Thing. So it's just having you, giving you the space to talk mm. about certain things mm. that you're, you know, you care about, mm. that you, you know, you find valuable. And it seems so invaluable that the world could use it. Mm. And is it their pride? Is it the fact that it's cost? Is it because, well, if we care more about profit over people, mm. This method would actually eat our profits, ironically, like the bacteria eating the heavy metals. <laughs> so it's, a bit of uh, you see what I mean? So it's like, well, if they're not using it and they can, mm. why not? And if you know these people, maybe it's worth holding these shareholders accountable, mm. these mm. companies accountable, going, there is a way, and yet you're not doing it. So it comes down to accountability. It comes down to having a voice. It comes down to knowledge. It's coming mm. down to, you know, giving it the power to the people so that they hear this and go, right, now what do you do with this information mm. now that you've heard it? You know, do you want your community to eat foods that are healthier for you? Because at the end of the day, what are we doing this for? We're learning from the generation before mm. so that we can pass the baton to the next generation after us to not have to forego these issues that are avoidable at the end of the day. Mm. That 
There are people out there who care, not just about profit, but they care about, well, there's a way here that just seems beneficial for communities. Why would we not take that approach mm. if we know it's in the betterment of all? Yep. And that's the question. It's like, well, of course we will. And it's those people, the game changers, those who, you know, stand out in history, who see that and go, well, that's more important. Even if I'm getting pressure and people are, you know, trying to stop us or me or whatever it is, that we're going to do it because it's, it seems to be the, I don't want to use the word right thing to do because whatever there is, the right, there's always the other side being the wrong. But what seems divine, mm. the divine thing to do, mm. you know? And it's just acting out of our divine, no matter the pressures around us that would want mm. to not be shown because what they may see is something about themselves that they don't like. Mm. That you're saying, hey, there's another way here. And they go, whoa, whoa, whoa challenging us then we have to look within ourselves and go why are we not actually adapting this is it because we really actually care about money more than people because our advertisement shows that that's not the case so that makes us a hypocrite and we do not want to be seen as that so get out of our face you know do not show up again mm -hmm. so it's beautiful that people like you come along and show up and go right there is a way hello you know japan has been doing it and you're an advocate for the japanese culture because they've accepted you they've loved you you've you know, been there your whole life, and now we're drinking matcha together yes. in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And Dubai has a lot of similarities to Japan, I feel, mm -hmm. in the regards to cleanliness, mm -hmm. you know, and care and, and things like this. Though it's different because it's not Japanese people here. Mm -hmm. It's a mix of everybody here. But the beautiful thing about Dubai is that leadership, that they can bring all these different cultures together and they get things they done. They do. And you have to... So you have to admire them. You know, the... the the wisdom, it's rare to find that anywhere, um, but the wisdom to create what has been created here in, what, 52 years? <laughs> it's insane. Um, and I, I always say it's fair, there is an alignment between Japan. You think about Japan. In 1945, Japan was a completely decimated economy. Tokyo was, all the major cities were bombed and they were gone. By 1964, they were the second biggest economy in the world less than 20 years. Now, isn't that incredible? Look here at Dubai. There was a group of, you know, there was a group of seven emirates who were, you know, decided they were going to form a country. Um, and that must have been challenging. <laughs> you know, really, it wouldn't have been easy. And and then look what they've created. It's, it's amazing. Well, you know, this is also challenging the idea that you know, what is wrong and right. And though what happened in Japan was devastating, especially for those closest to it. Yes. However, if we, sk if we zoom out and look at the, the bigger vision, the, the idea of the universal law, what love actually is, mm. you know, this needed to happen because that is what's happening within us micro and macro out of us, that things are destroyed and things are created. That is just the universe. And what we deem as bad is uh, morality, mm. it's subjective. Mm. And though bombs went off and people lost their lives, we also have to look at the view of, well, who says not being in this planet is a bad thing? Mm. You know, from life to death, this idea that, mm. well, that's bad because that person died. Well, we don't know what's after life, no, you I know? Don't. So who are we to say what's bad and, and good? because energy can either be created or destroyed. Mm. So what is actually being destroyed? The matter of what we're attached to. These things happen and Japan bounced back and suddenly this, this flourishing happened. You know, this, it's like pruning trees and things suddenly grow and, and it's needed. Though our idea of what happened was terrible. Though people obviously in America and certain governments and you watch a new film, Oppenheimer, you know, created, who created the atomic bomb you know, was devastated by the fact that he created it, but he obviously needed to create it because of the universal law that was in play. Like, things needed to happen, otherwise it just wouldn't have happened. And who are we to look back and go, well, we wish this didn't happen, that didn't happen. Well, everything needed to happen to lead us to where we are today. And rather than being a place of, you know, uh, pain about it, but rather learn from it and to pass this knowledge on to the next generation so these people didn't lose their lives in vain, you know, that actually everything was out of an act of love. It's just our 
subjective views of it would say that that was a bad thing. But there's neither good without the bad. You know, neither bad without the good, neither right without the wrong. And I'm just really, I'm putting this in here because, you know, the new earth is this place of recognizing that the universal play here is everything is out of love. Yep. Everything is out of, you know, destroying, creating, destroying, creating, it's ever evolvement of our evolution. You know, without the wars that we had, we wouldn't have the evolution that we, we see today. And that's true, and you wouldn't have the Japan of today without that war, yeah. to be honest. And one of the most moving things you can do in Japan, I've been privileged on several occasions to be down in Nagasaki and down in Hiroshima um, on the commemoration days of the dropping of the atomic bombs. And the honesty of, in the Peace Park Museum, the honesty of, of how it's talked about and how it's sh shown, you know, it, it, it is moving, very moving. And there you have the city that, you know, both the two cities, Nagasaki is often the forgotten sister. Um, they have come out of that. You know, that bomb was only dropped in 1945. Um, they've come out of that, creating a beautiful environment that's clean, that's not radioactive anymore. And, um, and, and they've created not only a, a wonderful environment, but also a lesson, a continuous, continuous lesson for the world about what can happen and what, what can come out of it. And um, it's, it's just very, very moving. I recommend to anybody, if you ever get the chance to go to Japan, you don't need to wait for the commemorative day, go down to Nagasaki or go down to Hiroshima and go and spend a day and visit the Peace Park and the Peace Park Museum. Take the tour, put the headphones on, listen, and you'll, you'll be shocked at, at just how brutally honest they are about it from both their side and the Allies' side. And, um, but, it's, but they want the world to be a peaceful and progressive place. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. Very moving. Well, bringing things into equilibrium, isn't it? Not blaming yes. anybody else, no. but just saying, well, this happened and that happened. Mm. Let's move on. Yep. I think that's a beautiful way to end this, Yeah, I think Mark. so. Thank, um, you. thank you. I really appreciate your time. Oh, thank coming you very on. much. I um, really enjoyed it. And yeah? Uh, the time's just flown by. So no. I, I hope it didn't drivel on too much. <laughs> well, you know, uh, people who are interested in, in the very things of food and matcha and the culture of Japan and you know, sustainability in the community will stick around, yep. you know. And at the end of the day, it's for you to have a platform to speak and share your share your truth and share what it is you love. So thank you for being on here and thank you all for checking us out. Looking forward to thank you. putting it out there. Yeah, well, I'll get some further information to you so you've got that as well. So Yes, um, please do. Um, and if, um, if anybody is interested to go and have a look at some of these things in Japan, I'd love them to do that. Please send everything over that you've mentioned and then we can yep. plug it in the right time. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very Til much. Till next time. Arigatou gozaimashita. Aha. Namaste. <laughs>